Hello, I'm David D. Cosbo, and this is Preview, a public affairs presentation of Electric City Television. We're broadcasting again from home, our guest joining us by computer video link, and that guest today is Mark Crosetti Jr. from the Luzerne County Historical Society. Um, I gather the offices, the library pretty much shut down? We are. Uh, we've been closed. So we, our museum building is closed. Uh, our archives, our offices. Uh, of course, there's no no tours of the Scotland Homestead or the Nathan Dennison House. Uh, we are trying to do some work from home. Um, you know, some administrative things, a few of the photographs and the virtual exhibitions that we'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, we're running a pretty limited capacity right now, just because there's not not a lot of what we do in your home. Sure. Well, uh, you, you kind of already hinted at the fact that there are nonetheless some online possibilities available for people that are uh, seeking information. There, there are indeed. Um, of course, even before all this, uh, we did do research to the mail. Uh, the forms are available on our website or you could call or uh, check in with us and you can uh, tell us what you're looking for and we would check and uh you know, take a look and then send you whatever we found. And most of that was genealogical type research. When uh, the outbreak occurred, we sat down, we were talking about what we could do uh, basically to try to keep us uh, in the public eye and maybe share some of our collections with the public that they might not see. You know, if you have such a, a large collection and of course uh, you can't put everything on display all the time. So we started putting up photographs. We have a collection of about 65, 66,000 photographs. Now, obviously, not all of them are able to be transported to our houses and scanned and everything. But we, we've been putting up ones that we have access to relatively easily. We're one a day, sometimes two a day. Uh, we're at 42 or 43, now I forget the exact number. And we've been getting a big... Uh, Big response from that. Just about 30,000 people have viewed the exhibition so far, according to our Facebook numbers, and the response has been pretty, pretty good for that. We also have a blog on our website, uh, which is LuzerneHistory.org, and you just go to the top and click blog. And myself and our museum manager, Allison Earl, have been doing a series of what we call FIC posts. FIC is uh, museum something, it means found in the collection. It's basically an item that, uh, for whatever reason, here you know, wasn't really documented so well when uh, it was first brought in. But when it was eventually a session, we just said, well, we found it in the collection. So what Allison and I have been doing is we've been going back and trying to research uh, where they came from, why we have some of these pieces, and then photographing them and telling a little story uh, with them. And those have been pretty popular as well. We actually started with Allison found a piece of, well, it looks like a piece of wood, but it actually was a chunk of the Andersonville prison from the Civil War. Uh. And uh, a local man was a POW at Andersonville and the whole story of how it ended up coming up here. So we've done a few of those posts. We're working on a few more. And just the idea is to try to share our collection with the public during this time and hopefully, you know, educate, you know, because we, we are an educational institution and hopefully keep that going. And fortunately, I guess uh, at the state level, there are a number of uh, museums and such that have virtual tours available. There are. Um, I know the... Uh, Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia is doing a lot of video tours. They're doing some online lectures. Uh, I believe the State Archives has put up some digitized items in their collection, maps and different correspondence and things. So uh, if you are researching from home, you can. Uh, now is a good time. More and more stuff is going up every day during this. Uh, the big websites, genealogybank.com, ancestry.com, they all have free trials, and I believe some of them are actually extended. I think some of them are a month now instead of a week. So if you are think, if you're at home and you're thinking about doing some research, uh, now would be a good time to take deeper toe in the water, see if you like it, and it's pretty low risk. And how about reaching the historical society at this time? 
Uh, your best bet at this time is probably through email. Uh, you can reach me at uh, mricetti, M-R-I-C-C-E-T-T-I, at luzernhistory.org, or our general email is info, I-N-F-O, at luzernhistory.org, and uh, that'll go into the general box, but eventually it'll go to, you know, who needs it, uh, whether it be our librarian or myself or our uh, internal executive director. So those are probably the two best ways to reach us. Uh, you can also message us on Facebook. Uh, if you punch in Luzerne County Historical Society, your Facebook page comes up, and there's a message button there. We're usually pretty good. Within half hour, 45 minutes, so we usually get back to you. The Historical Society has taken pride, and rightfully so, in welcoming people to its historical treasures, which can't be done right now. However, we're beginning to see things reopen. Um, ordinarily, you'd be opening up, uh, I guess, your major attraction uh, at the end of May? Yes. Normally, uh, the last weekend in May is opening day for the Nathan Dennison House. We have uh, period reenactors dressed, guided tours. A lot of times we will open the, the Swetland Homestead the same weekend, and that really begins sort of our summer tour season. Um, this year, depending on what the governor does, I, you know, we don't know, we know May 8th, some things are opening. I don't believe libraries and museums are on the list. I have to double check again, but I don't think we're in the first phase. Um, hopefully, you know, the end of May, early June, we can start thinking about doing soft reopenings. I know when we reopen, whenever that may be, at least for the initial little while, we're going to limit it to groups of 10 just to try to maintain social distancing. Uh, some of the houses are small, it's a little tighter this way. If you have a smaller group, it's a little bit easier to stay spread out. Um, of course, we will keep abiding by the, the CDC regulations for masks and gloves and that sort of thing if we need to. Uh, but hopefully in the next five or six weeks, I'm cautiously optimistic we may be able to do a soft reopen. I am intrigued by the fact that rather than uh, just sitting back and uh, offering what you can, you actually have a new initiative going, which involves uh, uh, gathering information from people who are affected by uh, the pandemic. I wonder if you'd, uh, first of all, explain what you're trying to do, and then we can perhaps see whether you're getting some reaction. <laughs> well, uh, it's... It Oftentimes, it's easy to miss the fact that you may be living through a historical event, much less a major historical event. And of course, uh, you know, the coronavirus outbreak is absolutely a major historical event. So we want to know how it is affecting people. We are looking for uh, stories from people of all ages, all walks of life, people that are still classified as essential workers, people that uh, may have been furloughed, or people that are working from home. Uh, you know, do you know anyone, you know, that has affected their lives? Do you know anyone that has the virus? You know, do you, or any of your relatives? So we're looking for stories. They could be text. They could be audio recordings. They could be video recordings, like what we're doing now. Um, email them to us, and this way we can begin to catalog them, and we can put them into our archives once it reopens. And this will be something else that researchers can use going forward. And hopefully, you know, 20, 30 years from now when the virus has been eradicated and people, students are doing papers on it and saying, oh, what was that like? Well, we'll have information that we can share with them. Uh, the response has been pretty good so far. We have a few uh, tech stories that we've been going through, uh, you know, and they're, uh, they're good because oftentimes we'll get, they'll attach a note with them and say, oh, this is probably just, you know, boring, run-of-the-mill, day-to-day stuff, their words. Well, that's good. That's what we want. We want to catalog every, you know, last detail that we can. So it's stories about, you know, how it affects them going to the grocery store during the day. It's stories of, you know, not being able to go check in on an elderly relative because now they can't get to the nursing home to see them. And so while that may seem like run-of-the-mill stuff, that is the kind of things that details that will get lost as we go further and further down the road, so it's important to document now. Yeah, ironically, I guess in, in uh, 
past situations, uh, you, you think of uh, the Agnes Flood, you think back uh, uh, to uh, the Asian uh, flu, to uh, the Spanish flu, you gathered those things, but you gathered them in retrospect. Now you've got an opportunity to, uh, as it were, capture the moment for the future involving our history. <laughs> Exactly. Um, it, you know, and oftentimes a little bit of hindsight, a little bit of delay isn't the worst thing when you're documenting history. But at the same time, a lot of the details can get fuzzy. And a lot of times, you know, when people go back to work, once everything reopens, whether it be in stages or whether it be more of a uh, quicker reopening, people aren't going to want to sit down and talk about this. And I can understand that it's affected them for, you know, the last six weeks, eight weeks, they're going to want to get on with their lives. So while we have the the opportunity, I think it's very important that we take it and hopefully document some of these. And ironically, we're we're in a sense doing that right now, doing an interview we would normally do in a studio, uh, from uh, one house to another, um, and using uh, you know it is fortunate that we do have the uh, technology today to maintain communications and even promote something like this, uh, this endeavor of the historical society. It's very useful that we're able to communicate. You know, we're very thankful this way we can still stay in touch with everyone. But it's also very helpful in documenting it. Um, you know, the, everyone, it's been in the news lately about the Spanish influenza. Well, Spanish influenza was really a bit of a misnomer. Um, at the time, Spain was a neutral country in World War I, so they weren't suppressing the media. They had true freedom of the press because they didn't have any wartime censorship. So they were the only country that was actually reporting on the influenza pandemic. So they got stuck with the moniker Spanish influenza when actually it started out in military bases in Kansas, was really where we, we now know the first major outbreaks were. So because of this, it's a lot harder to hide information it's a lot easier to get the correct information and hopefully uh some of the myths and things that we've had in the past we won't have this time are you looking for uh, written reports from individuals uh video reports uh, what what kind of material are, are you searching for all of the above if you want to handwrite and send a letter in the mail absolutely if you want to type something on a computer and email us absolutely if you want to film yourself with a webcam and put it in a dropbox file or a google drive file we'll take that too audio recordings are good too anyway whatever is easiest for the people that are submitting it we will be happy to take i wonder uh, obviously uh, the historical society is one of those organizations that depends so much on uh, the public with regard to donations, on uh, volunteers with regard to getting the projects done, I would think that there would be a shortage of both at this time. There have been, um, but at the same time we're very lucky in that this is something that our volunteers can work on from home as well. We can review the, the stories and then send them uh, to different volunteers for cataloging and for processing. And uh, uh, our membership has been great during these times. We are in the middle of our annual appeal, uh, as we always do in the spring. We, we, we do our, our annual appeal, and the donations are still coming in. Uh, I can't thank our membership base enough. I can't thank the public enough uh, because they know it's not just us. It's every nonprofit right now is struggling. Um, so if you have a favorite nonprofit, whether it be the Historical Society, whether it be a library, whether it be a college, whatever your preferred nonprofit is, if you can make a donation, or if you could volunteer from home, that would be a massive help because they're all struggling. Everyone is. Does your board continue to meet to sort of plan as best it can for the future? They do. They, they do very similar to what we're doing now. <laughs> they've been uh, Zoom, Zoom meetings uh, with that, but they, they've actually been meeting a little bit more often. They're up to twice a month now instead of once a month to try to you know go take it in a couple week chunks at a time. But we're trying to keep as much normalcy as humanly possible. And now, of course, the big question is when you're going to be allowed to reopen the physical facilities. And as you already indicated, that's uh, pretty much up to state mandate. Yes, um, you know, and we don't want we don't want to rush it. We're, we're all very eager to still be open, and I know we have people 
who are eager to join us, and we're grateful for that, but we, we don't want to rush it, and when uh, people a lot smarter than me tell me it's okay to go, that's when we're going to go. Do you have any events that are absolutely uh, set in time that must be done at a particular time, or or can they pretty much uh, be uh, just moved to another date? I mean, I think all the way ahead to July, of course, and the uh, observance of the Wyoming Monument, which is such a tradition locally. Yes. We're lucky in that pretty much all of our events we can be flexible with. Our annual meeting is supposed to be in April, but we do have clauses in our bylaws for cases of force majeure, which of course this obviously is. Uh, there is the 4th of July at the Wyoming Monument. There is generally the, as we said earlier, the opening of the Nathan Denison House on Memorial Day weekend. Both of those are, you know, traditions. The monument's a little tougher since, you know, July 3rd was the actual battle. So to move it, you can move it, but that's, you know, it's a little tougher once you move it off. Uh, but for the most part, we can move things around to when we need to. Uh, right now, our, our second road rally, historical road rally, scavenger hunt, is still scheduled for the first week in August. Hopefully that uh, will be able to take place. We've moved our gala to August 25th. That was going to be in, in uh, June, but we, we pushed it back about 60 days to August 25th. So uh, October, uh, Dr. Lewis is still planning the ghost walks. So hopefully October, you know, things will, will be a bit more normal there. And that's a little bit easier because that's outside and you can spread out. You know, we have a bullhorn and everything for that. But we have flexibility going forward, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about one thing. You kind of touched on it. Uh, has there been more public interest in the uh, facilities and the information available through the Historical Society while people have been uh, sort of uh, locked into their homes? There has been a, a bit of a resurgence in genealogical research because uh, no doubt I'm sure, you know, I'm the same way, I'm sure you're the same way, Dave. When we're home, we're, we're looking for things to do and there's things that we have an interest in that we probably have just dabbled in a little bit. Oh, I'm going to pick that back up again, you know. Uh, you know I, I've been working on, I, I have an old Honda three-wheeler, I've been working on that out in the yard because I have the time now. Well, a lot of people, especially around here, are into genealogy. It's a very big hobby. And so people are sitting down and they're accessing a lot of the online resources and then they can only get so far or they come to a place that says, oh, the Historical Society has this birth record or the Historical Society has this marriage license. So then they contact us. And a lot of it is just, hey, you know, we know you're closed right now, but when you reopen, is this something you have that I can come and look at? And, and you know, and that's going forward. That way they know where they can access the material. Um, some of them are a little bit more in-depth research requests, and we are trying to do as much as we can with them from home. And some of them we can, and some of them we can't. Uh, our librarian, Amanda Fontanova, she's been handling a lot of that because she actually has access to a lot of different things on her computer that I don't necessarily do. She, she has more of our databases and our indexes and things. Um, but it's just a lot of it is just people are going, oh, yeah, you know, they're, they have this, they have that. And that's good because that keeps us, you know, in the back of their minds going forward. It sort of reminds people that there are resources available that perhaps they haven't tapped. And this is a good time to uh, take advantage of those resources. Definitely. Um, you know, and there's uh, your local libraries. I mean, same thing. They're, they're closed right now, but a lot of them have skeleton crews and they're working from home. They're answering emails. You know, if there's something on there, by all means, check them out. And uh, another place to look, you never know, it's pretty hit or miss, but it's free, and sometimes you get surprised, is Google Books. Google has been scanning a lot of older texts that are now out of copyright. I know they actually just started on the uh, Harvey Smith, the six-volume Harvey Smith history of Wilkesbury and the Wyoming Valley. Now, they only have two, the first two volumes up of the six, but this is a book set that's been out of print for the better part of a hundred years and goes for several hundred dollars when you can find one. Now you can access it for free. So, uh, you know, since we all have a little bit more free time, take a shot, look, look in places you might not think because sometimes you're pleasantly surprised. 
Well, one more time then, uh, how do they connect with you and the, the Historical Society right now? Uh, your best bet's through email, uh, info at luzernhistory.org, I-N-F-O at luzernhistory.org. Or if you have Facebook, go on Facebook and message us. We're the Luzerne County Historical Society on Facebook. Just click the message button. Or if you have Twitter, uh, we do have a Twitter. Uh, we're not as active on there, but we do we do answer on there. It's uh, at LCHS1858 on Twitter. Well, Mark, I thank you for spending some time with us. And uh, it, uh, we look forward to uh, hopefully in the very near future seeing all the facilities open again so the people can enjoy our history right here in Luzerne County in person. We look forward to having the public again, and uh, thank you for having me on today, Dave, and thanks for you know giving us the time to tell people about what we're doing. Good. Hope we see you in person next time, Mark. Take care. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. All right. Bye-bye. And thank you for joining us on Preview here on Electric City Television. I'm Dave DeCosmo. Till we see you again next time, here's hoping all your news is good.